morning, Alfred Street. Um, I beg your patience this morning as I seek to build a foundation upon some of the things that were taught and shared on last week in the season of Advent. And if you were not able to be with us, it's my prayer that you'd be able to watch the service online and connect the dots between last week and this week. In preparation for the word of the Lord on this second Sunday of Advent, I want to draw your attention to the book of 2 Peter in the New Testament. That's way in the back. The easiest way to find it is go to Revelation and then go left just a few pages. And you should be in 2 Peter. If you have difficulty finding 2 Peter, it's right after 1 Peter. Amen. It's <laughs> right after 2 Peter chapter 3. I want to read in the New International Version this morning, beginning in verse number 8. And once you have found that, if you're physically able, we invite you to stand. As together we reverence the reading of the Word of God in 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse number 8. A strange passage of Scripture for the Christmas season. And yet there's one verse in there that may sound familiar to you. Peter writes and says, but do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years. And a thousand years is like a day. And the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with this promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, Make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. This morning on the second Sunday of Advent, I want to talk to you about dealing with divine delays. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Dealing with divine delays. On last weekend, you will recall for those who were in this space that I shared with you that Advent is about so much more than just remembering that Jesus Christ came to us as a babe in a manger. It is also embracing the message that Christ who has come is also coming back again. There's a lot we learned last week and I shared with you. We learned about the Christian liturgical calendar. We learned about the dating of Easter. You learned about the autumnal and the vernal equinox. And you now know that Easter is on the first Sunday on or after the first full moon after the vernal equinox. And even if you've forgotten all of that, the one thing I hope you have not forgotten is that Christ is coming back. That is a message that is critical and crucial to our faith and so often we have strayed from it. You've not heard messages about the imminent return of Jesus Christ and not preaching and embracing the fact that Christ is coming again leaves us defective as disciples. Because Paul reminds us that in that message we are given three reminders of things that hold us together when life gets rough. Number one, the message that Christ is coming again, it exposes our help. It reminds us that no matter how bad it is, help is on the way. Number two, it elicits our hope. 
It encourages us to know that things are going to get better because the Lord is coming back. And when the Lord comes back, things will be made well. And then finally, it encourages our holiness. Because the reality is you never know when the Lord is going to return. And I asked you last week what I ask you again today. What do you plan on being caught doing when the Lord shows up? And since there's no guarantee he's coming on Sunday, <laughs> my best advice to you is to live holy every day as much as you can because you never know what you're going to be caught doing when the Lord shows up. There's just some stuff I don't want Jesus to catch me doing. Go on, preach, Pastor. Uh, that, that, that message of this coming of Jesus Christ, it, it, it is everywhere in the New Testament. In the Gospels, Jesus makes illusion after illusion and parable after parable that is meant to let us know he's coming back. When he ascends to heaven in Acts chapter 1, the angels are gathered there and they say to his disciples, why are you staring up into heaven? The same Jesus who has ascended will one day come back. The book of Revelation is all about what's going to happen when Christ returns to the earth and how things are going to play themselves out. And all throughout the writings of Paul and Peter, they both stress that you remember Christ is coming back. And that's amazing because Peter and Paul couldn't agree about anything. But the one thing they agreed on was that Christ is coming back. And you will recall that I shared with you in Greek, the original language of the New Testament, there's one word that shows up that is meant to refer to the second coming of Jesus Christ, and it is the Greek word parousia. Everyone say parousia. parousia. I want you to learn some Greek this morning. Parousia in the New Testament is almost exclusively a reference to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And that parousia was critical to early Christians, those first believers after the death of Jesus, those eyewitnesses and those ones who joined the church subsequently thereafter. Because after the death of Jesus, the church began to suffer persecution at the hands of the Roman government. The apostles were killed. Oppression existed. And what held them together was their belief that Jesus is coming back. And that when Christ comes back, our faith will be vindicated. When Christ comes back, justice will reign on the earth. When Christ comes back, we will be proven to be those who believed in the true and living God. That when Christ comes back, God is going to show himself strong and the world will know we are the chosen of God. They believed Christ was coming back. And they believed he was coming back soon. Real soon. Like tomorrow soon. Right around the corner soon. They believed they would see Christ in their lifetime. They got that from the words Jesus gave as he was preparing his disciples for his departure. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 28, Jesus has gathered his disciples together and joy he tells them, listen, some of you all will not die before you see the Son of Man coming back. And that left them with the expectation that within one generation, they would see the Lord return. They believed Jesus would be back long before any of them died, that the original followers of Jesus would still be alive when the Lord came back. They expected he was coming, and he was coming soon. Like real soon. Like tomorrow soon. Right around the corner soon. They believed they would see him in their lifetime. 
There are many things that shaped the early believers and the first churches. One of the things that shaped them was the oppression from the Roman government. One of the things that shaped them was Paul preaching to Gentiles and them having to include Gentiles into the church. One of the things that shaped them was the martyrdom, the killing, the stoning, the crucifixion of the church leaders. But the one thing that shaped the church more than anything else that affected who they were and who we still are is another systematic theological term I want you to learn in church today. The most defining dynamic of the early Christian church is something called the delayed parousia. Let the church say delayed parousia. Delayed parousia. Now somebody tell them welcome to seminary. Welcome to seminary. If you know that parousia is the second coming of Jesus, then you ought to know what the delayed parousia is. The second coming of Jesus, in their opinion, was delayed. Christ did not come back as they expected. They thought he was coming soon. And here we are, some 2,000 years later, and we are still waiting on Christ to come back. That is one of the most defining dynamics of the Christian church that they waited and we are still waiting on the Lord to come back. And that delay has shaped our church in ways that cannot be overestimated. Can I give you an example? Is it all right to teach history this morning? You've got four Gospels in your Bible. Let's name them. Matthew. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The seminarians and preachers who've been to school will tell you the first Gospel written is the Gospel of Mark. Mark is dated around 70 to 72 A.D. The first gospel to record the life of Jesus is written in 70 or 72 A.D. Historically, Jesus is crucified around 32 A.D. Jesus dies in 32 A.D. The first gospel doesn't come out to 72 A.D., which means the first gospel to record the events of the life of Jesus came out 40 years after his death. Why did it take 40 years to write the life of Jesus in a gospel? Because they thought he was coming back. There was no need to write his life when the original followers were still alive, preaching what had happened and believing that before they died, Christ would come back. Ain't no need to write it down. He'll be here tomorrow. And so these apostles were telling the story of Jesus. Nobody had written it down. And then the delay came. Time passed. The disciples died. The first followers of Jesus died. And the stories of his life were told and retold and retold and retold. And you know what happens when stories are passed on. Details change. Variations in the story happen. You ever hear folk talk about something that happened to you and you trying to figure out if they're talking about you? The story has changed so much. There are variations. Let me give you an example. There was one thread of story that said Jesus healed a man on the road and the man's name was Bartimaeus. There's another version that says, no, he healed two men on the road. And so Mark writes 
and tells the version that he heard, which is one. Matthew writes and tells the version he heard, which is two. So sometimes the discrepancy of detail that you read between the Gospels is due to the fact that nobody wrote it down after Jesus died. They just passed the stories around. Tell somebody, tell you, you're learning something today. You're learning something today. You're learning. So Mark is the first writer to de detail the life of Jesus. And after Mark, other writers did the same. Example, go home and read Luke chapter 1, verse 1. And in Luke chapter 1, verse 1, here's what Luke says. He says, many other people other than me have begun writing the life of Jesus. I have researched it all, and I am writing my version so that you will know what happened according to my perspective. Luke is doing the same thing Mark was doing, which is writing his gospel to verify the details of the life of Jesus so the story would stop changing because Jesus did not come back. And so in a real sense, the delayed parousia was the inspiration for the writing of the gospels. You would not have Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John if Jesus had come back when the disciples thought he would. But since he did not, they realized they had to get the story right, so they wrote it down. That's how you got the Gospels in your Bible because Christ did not come back and we had to stop telling different stories. Teach the Bible, Pastor. Jesus didn't come back. Days passed, weeks went by, years elapsed, people start dying, the apostles were killed, and the delay of Jesus coming back caused real concern in the church and conflict outside the church. There were those who were expecting the return of Jesus, and when Jesus did not come back the, inside the church, they went to their leaders and said, hey, Where's Jesus? Y'all said he'd be back. We endured oppression believing that Christ was coming back. We didn't snap on somebody because you told us Jesus was on his way back. And the Lord didn't show up. What do we do with a Jesus who ain't back yet? They didn't know how to deal with a divine delay. And this book we read from today, 2 Peter, is Peter trying to help them deal with a divine delay. The whole reason this second book of Peter shows up is because in his first letter, Peter tried to tell the church how to act while they were waiting for Jesus. He told them, be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He gave them instruction to be steadfast because Christ was coming. And then the delay. And when the delay came, there were those who mocked the church. Those who stood outside and said, where's this Jesus y'all was talking about? You said he was coming. We haven't seen him. There were those inside the church that began to doubt the leadership of the church. You told us Jesus was coming back. He's not here. Can we believe you? There are those who discredited the gospel. You said he was coming back. He hasn't come back. Is anything you're saying true? Was he ever really born? Did he ever really die? Was he really resurrected from the dead? Everything about the gospel was called into question because of the delay of the coming of Jesus Christ. So Peter's got a right to fix it. He writes this letter to help us understand why the Lord hasn't come back yet. And notice how Peter addresses the divine delay. This is what he says. Oh, the Lord is coming. And he's going to come like a thief in the night. And know this, God is not slow. God hadn't forgotten his promise. God didn't get busy. God didn't get on another call. God is not slow in doing what he said. 
Here's why the Lord hadn't come back. Watch this, it's deep. Because when you're with God, a day to God can be a thousand years to you. He says a day with the Lord can be as a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. Here's what Peter's really saying. You want to know why the Lord Jesus hasn't come back? It's real simple. God's time is not our time. Somebody, you ought to write that down. Get that as your next tattoo. God's time <laughs> is not our time. God does not operate under the same constraints of time that you and I do. Hear me, saint of God, what makes God different than you and me is that God is not restricted by time. You and I are prisoners of time. We only have but so much time. And that's why you get aggravated with giant turkeys who waste your It's the most valuable possession I have because I only have but so much of it. And after so much time, I can't do what I should have gotten done. Ain't nothing worse than trying to do at 60 what you should have gotten done at 30. Because time takes away my strength. But here's what makes God God. God doesn't get old. God doesn't age, God doesn't weaken, and God is not restricted by time. God don't care about calendar and clock. God doesn't have any due dates. God doesn't have deadlines. You can't tell God what to do and when he needs to do it. God is sovereign, and God works outside of time. So if you remember that, here's how Peter explains the divine delay. Oh, the Lord is coming. And the Lord said he'd be back in a few days. But since a few days with God can be a thousand years with us, that when Jesus said he'll be back, that may be in a thousand or more years. Peter says to the church, the reason the Lord isn't back yet is not because he's not coming. Say with me, this is deep. He's not back because our projection of when was wrong. We projected it in human time, but it's going to happen in God's time. And in our human projection, we didn't get God right. Come here, come here, come here. This is deep. Peter says, our calendar was wrong. Our timeline was off. Our prophetic prediction was erroneous. We did not get it right. Because every now and then, divine truth is veiled in human inaccuracy. Come, 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 come. Peter acknowledges what the church has failed to embrace, and that is that every now and then, we get God wrong. Oh, I know your Bible's big. You go to that fancy church, and they got worship all day long, 24-7. Every day of the week you pray, you speak in tongues, but you are still human, and that means you are prone to get God wrong. Listen, listen, I don't care who she is, who he is, what collar they wear, what title they bear, bishop, pope, prelate, reverend, doctor, pastor, elder, it does not matter. If you are human, you are prone to get God wrong. Beloved, we are sinful. My mind is sinful. My eyes are sinful. My hands are sinful. 
And sinful minds cannot always think of God correctly. Sinful eyes cannot always see God right. Sinful hands cannot always write God down correctly. Sometimes we get God wrong. And when Peter acknowledges that our timeline of the return of Jesus was wrong, he pulls you and I into a deep religious philosophical debate about the relationship between truth and accuracy. Come here, come here, come here, come here. What is the relationship between truth and accuracy. How much accuracy has to exist for something to be true? And can something be inaccurate and still be true? I want you to think about this for a minute. This has deep implications, deep implications that we wrestle not with as we should. And it leaves you ill prepared to defend your faith because the world is filled with people who deny truth because of inaccuracy. You know somebody right now who goes to the Bible searching for accuracy and not truth. And when they find inaccuracy, they doubt and deny truth and ask you to explain truth when they share with you inaccuracy. So, so how do you defend the truth of God creating the heavens and the earth when there's no biblically accurate data about dinosaurs. They come to church looking for accuracy and missing out on the truth because they see a flawed preacher who's got problems just like you and just like me and they deny that truth can come through a flawed vessel. Can I preach right here? Because I don't ever want you to lift me up on a pedestal. Baby, I'm as jacked up as everybody in this place. I've got problems like you got problems. I got issues like you got issues. I got some stuff like you got some stuff. But here's the good news. The truth of God can shine through the inaccuracy of human hands. Oh, can I give you some good news? You don't have to be perfect for God to use you. God has so much truth that it shines through even when I'm not what I ought to be. That truth can exist even in inaccuracy. Human perfection has never been a prerequisite for divine truth. God doesn't need perfect hands for his truth to come out. The grace of God is that God always uses inaccurate, flawed, sinful, jacked up folk. Do you know why God uses inaccurate, sinful, flawed, jacked up folk? Because that's all he got. You got to work with what you got. <laughs> and as a child of God, your first commitment has to be to truth, not human accuracy. Let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. An example of the relationship between truth and accuracy is clearly laid out in the dating of Christmas. Can we teach? Here's my question for you. What is the historically accurate date of the birth of Jesus? When, mm, you heard that December 25th, I'm coming for you. When was Jesus really born? Well, no one knows for certain, but most scholars 
that they placed the date of the birth of Jesus between 2 B.C. and 7 B.C., with 4 B.C. being the most likely, as they backtrack from evidence in Scripture. They argue, April, that Jesus was born in the year 4 B.C. If that's the year, what's the month and the date? Somebody over there said December 25th. Well, they're biblical scholars who date based on biblical evidence and would suggest to you that a more appropriately accurate dating of the birth of Jesus is not in December, but rather in September. Hold on. I'm coming for you too. Uh, now, why do they say September? Few reasons. Number one, astronomically, they deal with the star of Bethlehem. And they suggest that the star that could be seen in the east that would give direction and guidance all the way to Bethlehem is a star that would only have appeared in September. And by December, with the rotation of the earth, it would no longer be visible. So those who first argue that the star that the wise men followed from the east to see Jesus could only have been seen in September. The second piece of evidence for September is their belief that December is winter and it's cold in the winter. And it would make no sense for shepherds to be outside in winter in the middle of the night watching some sheep when it's cold. So based on the star and the shepherds, there are those who suggest that a more biblically accurate dating of the birth of Christ should be September. Now, if that's true, here's the question you ought to be asking. Why then is the birth of Jesus celebrated on December 25th? If it really wasn't December 25th, why do we celebrate it on December 25th? Somebody say that's a good question. <laughs> Part of the answer requires a little bit of history. You got to go back to about 325 A.D. The Roman Empire ruled the world. And the emperor of the Roman Empire in 325 is a brother named Constantine. And some of you know from history Constantine is the first emperor to convert to Christianity. He is the first Christian emperor. And when he converts to Christianity, he presses throughout the Roman Empire to remove all paganism and replace it with Christianity. Because the emperor is now Christian, the Roman Empire converts from paganism to Christianity, and Christianity is now the religion of the Roman Empire. And as they're switching everything from pagan to Christian, one that they dealt with is a festival that the Romans celebrated called Saturnalia. Everyone say Saturnalia. Saturnalia was a festival that was celebrated during the winter solstice. It was their celebration of Saturn, who prior to Constantine, the Romans identified as the god of the sun. So when they saw the sun, they thought of God, and they named that god Saturn. And they believed that that god was to be worshipped, and they worshipped that god and called the day of the worship the day of the sun, or as we know it, Sunday. Our term Sunday goes back to the Romans worshiping the sun god on this day that they called Sunday. Touch by telling them you're learning something. You're learning something. <laughs> so they celebrated the god of the sun and they did it during the winter solstice. Last week, you learned equinox. Today, you learn solstice. The solstice, the two days when the sun is either at its highest apex or lowest point relative to the equator. When it's at its highest point on June 21st, that's called the summer solstice. 
and it is the longest day of the year. The sun shines the most on June 21st. When the sun reaches its lowest point, that is December 21st, and that is called the winter solstice, and it's the shortest day of the year. The sun shines the least on December 21st. Have I thoroughly confused you yet? <laughs> Summer solstice, June 21, longest day. Winter solstice, December 21st, shortest day. Now, why did the Romans celebrate the sun god on the winter solstice, which is the shortest day of the year? Because the winter solstice is the day that the sun is at its lowest, which means it's about to rise again, which means daylight is about to increase, which means spring is on the way, which means light has beaten the darkness of winter. So in the Roman world, they celebrated the day that they honored that light has beaten darkness and spring is about to come and things are about to get better because the sun is about to rise. You haven't caught it yet. The celebration was that light is greater than darkness. The celebration was that things were about to get better. The celebration was that the dead of winter is over and the life of spring is about to begin. And you got to be slow not to see where this is going. <laughs> During the feast of Saturnalia, to celebrate light conquering darkness, when that feast was over on December 25th, they celebrated the birth of the sun god. December 25th for the Romans was the birth of Saturn, the sun god who gave light that defeated darkness. So in one hand, you've got a Roman empire that is used to celebrating around December 25th. Then add to it, there were another group of people who celebrated in December, the Jews. Because around the same time, they celebrate Hanukkah. Hanukkah is the Jewish celebration of the rededication of the temple. So watch what happens. Here come the Christians. The Romans and the pagans are used to celebrating in December. The Jews are celebrating in December. So the Christians say, that's a good time for us to celebrate. Since everybody's throwing a party in December, we might as well throw our party in December. And so because of Saturnalia, because of Hanukkah, there was a movement for the Christians to bring all those together in one great celebration. Now, there's biblical justification as well. And this gets a little deep. Please stay with me. I promise this is the last deep point of the sermon. The early Christians believed that the same date of the crucifixion aligned itself with the date of the incarnation. They believed that God worked in such a way that the day Jesus was crucified had to be the same date of the year that Jesus became incarnate, when Jesus became flesh. Now, when does Jesus become flesh? Not when he's birthed by Mary. Jesus becomes flesh when he becomes an embryo in Mary's womb. When does he become an embryo in Mary's womb? When the angel shows up and says the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you shall conceive child. When the angel announces to Mary her pregnancy, Jesus becomes flesh. And that is called the day of annunciation when the angel announced Jesus coming. Now, stay with me. The saints knew he was crucified around Passover, which was March 25th. And since in their mind, the incarnation and the crucifixion were on the same day. If Jesus is crucified on March 25th, then he also must become incarnate on March 25th, which means the conception of Jesus was dated as March 25th. Are you with me? If Jesus is conceived on March 25th, how long is a pregnancy? <laughs> Add nine months to March 25th, and guess what you got? <laughs> December 25th. So literally, 
because the Romans were celebrating and there's a movement from paganism to Christianity with the Jewish celebration and the belief that conception was on March 25th, which means birth had to be on December 25th, you add that all together and voila! <laughs> you got Christmas on December 25th. As early as 235 AD, a bishop named Hippolytus put in writing that Christ was born on December 25th. In 350 AD, Pope Julius I made an edict that all the Roman Catholic world would honor the birth of Jesus on December 25th. And as the Catholic Church swept over Europe and around the world, so did the celebration of Christ on December 25th. And there you have Christmas. In a real sense, a pagan holiday and a Jewish holiday got baptized. They were Christianized to become the celebration of the birth of Jesus. So back to our question, accuracy and truth. Is December 25th the historically accurate date of the birth of Jesus? In the words of Mr. from Color Purple, <laughs> could be, could be not, Who's to say? Was Jesus really birthed on the 25th? I don't know. Is that an accurate date? Could be, could be not. Is that historically correct? I don't know. But this much I know. Even if the date is inaccurate, the truth of his birth cannot be denied. I don't know if it's accurate. But this is what I do know. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. This is what I do know. Mary conceived and gave birth to a child and named him Jesus. And he was called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. That much is always true. And it doesn't have to be accurate for it to be true. Was Jesus born on December 25th? I don't know, and I don't care. You can put it whatever day on the calendar you want to put it on, but this much I know, he came, and he died, and he resurrected, and he's coming again. Would you slap fire with somebody and tell them now that's the truth. That's the truth. That Christ has come. And Christ is coming again. And as a child of God, we strive to make truth our priority. I acknowledge human inaccuracy. So what? That never invalidates God's truth. His truth shines through when we get it wrong. So when you meet that brother, that sister that tells you, I don't celebrate Christmas because that's not the actual birth of Jesus, ask him this question. So when do you? When do you acknowledge this truth? That in the fullness of time, God came into the world to redeem us from our sins, to prepare a place of our eternal salvation, and is coming back again. It's not the accuracy we celebrate. It's the truth. <laughs> 